All right, sure. Um, thank you, first of all, for giving me the opportunity to you know um, speak to you uh, as a part of you know OSC Hokkaido. I'm thankful. Um, next, uh, I'm, I'm really thankful that you know I can present whatever research work I have done. Um, considering that uh, research work is relatively new, it's only been about nine months. I have not even published a research paper. I'm still working over it. Um, but still, um, I would just like to talk about all the works that I've done until now, um, being a research student, and uh, how, how far really I've gone. So, starting off, uh, today I'll be discussing about uh, how exactly NMP um, as, as no, not exactly as a software, but as a technology is involving our lives. So that also means we will be looking at different aspects that the natural language processing offers us and how exactly do we have to, how exactly do we look at the technology because we look at machine learning, we look at AI, but NLP is something that people are not really giving preference to and that should actually be the focus right now. So starting off, uh, my name is Desveen and uh, I'm an undergraduate researcher at IIIT as well. Uh, which is one of the best institutes in India for research work. And uh, I'll be talking about how drastically um, the form of NLPs can take or how drastically we can um, take the idea of NLP ahead in the future. So starting off, uh, we'll be discussing about something called long short term memory networks, which is basically a part of uh, neural networks or RNNs, which we say. Um, so what, what exactly happens is this is a part of deep learning and text generation. So we use the techniques of deep learning in order to be able to um, accurately be able to predict what the next output might be. So what that means is um, we are the neural system of humans and the neural network or the neural system of computers is pretty much same. Um, just like how, you know, we have our perceptrons or we have the neurons or we have the different atoms within ourselves the same way there are these uh, different neurons in the uh, computer machinery aspect as well so basically the long short term memory networks uh, long short term memory networks are often used for um, natural language processing and deep learning they are used more for information persistence and second for neural networks so what that means is these are a part of RNNs, which are recurrent neural networks, which are basically more recent models. I would say they um, the, the, the different forms of it, but these usually predict the output through whatever came before it. Okay, so let me get to the gist. So a single neuron is a network that takes in a single piece of input data and performs some data transformation to produce a single piece of output. So we take in a single piece of input, we perform some data transformation to it in order to perform, and in order to produce a single piece of output. So as a reference, as you can see, we have an input, we have the neuron and we have the output. So the, the very idea of having neurons or having the network models is to get our system transmissions easy or um, in order to get our, in order to make our daily life simpler. So let us look at the long-term dependencies, which are a small part of the long short-term memory networks. Um, I'll try to speak slowly because uh, I've heard that the Japanese audience might not be very much familiar with this language. So um, I'll try going as slow as possible. So the long-term dependencies, which are basically a part of the long short-term memory networks are a broad family of RNNs which take in input at one particular point of time with the help of the neuron and uh, appropriate actions are performed and output at a given time step which is basically the time at a given duration or um, the sampling at a given duration is produced so basically um, if you look at the chatbox or if you look at the different applications of nlp such as probably um, website development using nlp all of them use these varied concepts of long-term dependencies where these families of RNN have a major influence to play out. And uh, these long short these long short term memory networks go a long way in predicting what output has to be has to come. So basically, let's assume um, I have a text called this is afternoon. And the very next sentence I said this is. So my system will accurately predict that something before afternoon 
was, I mean, something before this is in the previous sentence was afternoon. So the same afternoon words will be repeated. So this is why we say afternoon is repeated. So this was about long short term memory networks. We covered about the neural networks and we also talked about the long term dependencies. Although this is not all about the long short term memory networks, but this is a part of it. And uh, as you can see, we take an input at one time step. We, there's a neuron which moves it forward and at the same time it gives the output. And this input can be more significant than the output which might come at a later step. So there are different connections to be considered to it, but as of now, we'll just stick on to it. And next, let us consider the um, very challenge of uh, sentence parsing or how exactly does a sentence get the tagging form because there's a lexical part involved, there's a tagging part involved, there's also um, an exact match of the dictionary form, there's a syntactical form, there's the uh, different forms of parsing. And one of the most major parser used is the Stanford NLP parser, which is usually called, you can find it at the link of core um, nlp.com, which is basically the Stanford parser. And what it does is once you input an English sentence to it, it breaks it down into different forms. I mean, it's just like what you can see it in this example. Um, our example here is this is the best thing happened in my life. So this is just an example. And the next upcoming session will be taking different examples. So this um, is, so we all know what a verb is and we all know what a noun is. So what we do is we, first of all, take a noun. With noun, what happens is the uh, adjective and the determinant. So we take them as a set, as a three. These three form the noun phrase because this is a noun, and when these combine, the best thing makes more sense, more sense than being told best the, the thing. So when these three combine, we call them as the noun phrase. And <clears throat> when once we have another noun here, which is life, and we have my, this makes up another noun phrase. And then this noun phrase with another pronoun, obviously makes a pronoun phrase, but instead of, I mean, preface. And when this preface as a whole goes with the verb, it makes another preface. So what happens is um, we have different phases of, uh, I mean, we have different types of phrases, I would say, which are based on the noun phrases or the prefaces or the determinant phases, all of it will really call them determinant phases. So the noun phrases, together with the preface or is what our sentence is and that is one aspect of the lexical analysis and usually this is done with the help of stanford dependencies and universal dependencies um, we have something called parse phrase structure trees which are a part of uh, stanford nlp core core nlp which is done or uh, you can also run it simply on a machine by the means of a small output and Usually the task of extracting is done based on the grammatical structure and something called a head word and the words. So over here, we have a head word thing and this head word goes with another words which modifies this head. So initially our head was the thing and once we have the noun phrase, our total head word becomes the best thing. So you see the, 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 there are different aspects to be considered, but for now let's just stick on with this. And this is one aspect of it where we, uh, we usually consider that, you know, once we have the lexical analysis, once we have the syntactical point of view of a particular sentence, we can probably make things go ahead. And one thing to be kept in mind is this is available only in English and Chinese. So since the Japanese audience might not be very well phrased with the English language and probably um, with the Chinese phrase, uh, I mean, this Hirangana, which uses the Chinese script, script if I'm not wrong. So since the script is same, um, probably, you know, um, you can have an idea using the Chinese language aspect as well. But usually English and Chinese are the only two languages where we mostly use this, and this is available in those particular languages. So this is one aspect of it where I've tried covering the Stanford NLP because that's where you get the core aspect of it. And once this is done, um, <clears throat> this is all about the basics. So right now we're talking about the works or the software which I have been working on. It's called Anusarka. 
and it's a work which is basically based in the southern state of India, which is Telangana, and there's a city called Hyderabad. Um, since the Japanese audience might not be very good first with it, so um, in Hyderabad we have an institute called Triple IT, and we have this research work going on on Anusarka software. So basically, this is a text software which renders text from one Indian languages to another. So what happens is it works pretty much like a Google Translator, but the um, the efficiency or the output model or the um, in a way I would say um, how good the output is is far far better than Google Translator or Bing Translator or any other translator available in the market right now. So this is done using the Panini HDRDs concept, which is a typical. Indian concept, which was used in the previous four times. Um, so, um, to be to be told in a very short and precise way, this is just a software which we are developing. It is being developed since forty since since a lot of time now, and um, a lot of work is being done on the software because this is one of these indigenous softwares which helps the Indian languages maintain their heritage and richness. Because usually, um, you use a lot of companies are just in a rat race to um, explore the software or just to increase the increase the growth of the software but this software which we are working on this is specifically to maintain the dialects and the the basic um, the system or the basic um, whatever heritage it has to give us so the language translation is not lost and we are also well maintained with whatever we have to do with the language so it's basically a computer software and this is what we're working on and next thing, um, just in case, um, if you're feeling that you know you, you have already worked a lot on this, so just this small um, tutorial available on machine translation. So you can probably use Keras model. Um, this is just a small, um, I would say, a, um, a tutorial on how to make your own machine translation. So you can use Keras model, although you can also use the different Python libraries like SkyKit Learn, Matplotlib. But Keras models is usually preferred when making these NLP modules or a machine translation system. So in order to make a machine translation system, you need to use the SCQ to SCQ neural networks with the Terra model. And basically, um, starting off, you need to install Terra, TensorFlow, Keras, and NumPy, of course, because NumPy is where most of the numerical Python tasks are done. And TensorFlow is one of the major game changing software in terms of the neural, uh, in terms of nationalized processing. So you need to get yourself these three languages. Get yourself a data set. You can use Kaggle or you can also use GitHub, or the Kaggle is more preferred. And in terms of Anusarka, we use our own data set, which is made with the help of NPTEL lectures, which is a set of uh, the Indian video lectures recorded by teachers for the students, um, specifically in the university or undergraduate and graduate phases. So our data set is that. And you can also use any data set that you like, but the data set should have a consistency um, parameter and also the consist and all of the performance of the data set should be high enough so that it does not get diluted with the information. And next thing we need to get the code. Um, this can be shared using GitHub. Um, I'll be putting up my email ID at the last of the slides in case you want the code or you want the data set, you can send me an email. So you need to run these three codes machine plans, um, pre processing.py, training model.py, and test function. So training model.py, as the name suggests, you have to obviously train a model at first, put in the data set information. Train it again the raw information, whatever information you might have or whatever code you might run it through. And pre-processing is where the um, the syntactical or the analytical aspect of the machine has to be of the synthesis has to be looked upon. And test function is upon uh, of course the functions that you write in order to test whether your machine uh, whether your translation system is working good enough or not. And then you work on the pre-processing, which is basically EY, and the training model material which you work on, you just work on the model and of course the test function. And once you get all of this running, um, your test model should be running again. That's that's pretty good. I mean, you just have to install a couple of libraries, get yourself a data set, work on the code, set up the code, and then work on the code, and that's how you set up the machine. So it might sound simple, but it might not be. So you might have to go through the basics of NLP, go through the advanced courses of deep learning, and also TensorFlow and NumPy. Get yourself a couple of hands-on experience, and probably that should help you out. And <clears throat> once machine translation happens, um, I'll be taking up an example and I would exp uh, I'll be explaining this. 
So um, we've been looking at the analytical aspect of a sentence. So um, I'll, for example, over here, I'll be taking an example for now. Um, um, I hope my whiteboard is visible right now. <clears throat> Um, Ms. Teresa, is my whiteboard visible to you right now? Yes, it's fine. Okay, cool. Okay, right, thank you. So um, I'll be using a text example here. So you, you can use usually use any text that you want, but one example that I would take is um, one view is that Artificial um, intelligence is about designing systems that are as intelligent as humans. So this is my one sentence where we'll be working on the analytical aspect of the language. This is just one example. You can take any example that you want as a sentence. So our sentences, one view is that artificial intelligence is about designing systems that are as intelligent as humans. So to start off, we'll be naming them to different numbers. So um, let's just name the first one as zero because that's usually how it all begins. Right, so um, let's assume this is zero, this is one, two, three, four, um, five, six, seven, eight. Um, I don't have a uh, whiteboard right now with me, so I want to be able to draw without it. 15 and 16. Um, I guess I missed a word one. Okay, so this is what should make sense for now. So um, let's start off. We usually know that the numbering begins with zero. So we're gonna start off with zero first. So once we have the real zero, um, so one view is that artificial intelligence is about designing systems that are as intelligent as human. So first we have to find the root of the sentence or the one word we feel can be the icebreaker of the sentence. So in this view, we have one view in one sentence, which is basically um, telling us that you know this is view, and we have to ask the system what that view is. So for now, let's assume that is is our main root of the word. So once our zero begins, we can probably have it as three underscore is. So I'm basically putting this that as our root. Now, I mean, that is as a root. So what happens is we are putting the three as a root, which is is because we feel that it might have a great impact on how the sentence might be framed in the future. So let's just name it as root for now. And once our root is set, um, we can go ahead with the next parsing. So we know that there is is and it is done. After is, we'll have to have another word which might feel, uh, which we might feel as, uh, is, you know, probably the root of it, of the next sentences. So once we have the is, um, probably view can fit in or the term designing can fit in because what we're discussing here is there's a view and we're asking them what the view is. So is is one sentence, one aspect of it. And what is the view discussing about? It is discussing about designing. So that's a second aspect. So um, you probably have the view aspect over here as number two, uh, I would rather text. So two underscore view would be our second aspect. And our other aspect 
would be nine underscore designing. Now, do give care that here I did start my numbering with zero, but we are actually proceeding with plus one. So we started with the root, and then we have the two and the nine, which we feel are probably the icebreakers here. Now, once it happens, we know that view is a subject. So we can probably mark it as a subject over here, um, something like an underscore subject. Now, this is um, a reference, or usually, um, this is, this is just a point of view where we usually prefer to say that after a root, there's usually a subject and a C comp associated with it. So a C comp is basically, um, it describes what exactly we're doing here, more like a work. So once an um, end subject is done, you can probably say that this is C comp. And once we have that, so we have two and nine. So I'll be um, erasing this so that I can draw the next part. So once we have the two and nine, now since we have two underscore view and we have the um, nine underscore designing. Now our view is done. Uh, I mean, um, our is is done, our view is done, our designing is done. So now the next aspect is what exactly comes under the view part. So what are we viewing? So that view is associated with one over here. So I can write that after a view, I have one, which is basically one underscore one. Now this one is again a num mod because it's a number and that number is being described again. So this can be something written as num mod. So our view is associated with the one as a number modulus. And our designing over here, you see our designing is involved with a lot of aspects here. We have um, that over here. I mean, our one is done. We have that. And then we have probably intelligence. And this is and this about. So we're basically considering the parts which were involved before the design. We were considering the parts which have been involved before the view. So before the design, we have roughly four points. The that intelligence is and about. So, and probably systems because um, designing is related with systems. So let's just assume that we have to use systems as well. So once uh, this aspect is done, we can probably pull out four, five lines. This one is for dark, this is for um, intelligence, is about and system. So um, we'll be starting with that first. And um, after that, we had intelligence. So six underscore intelligence problem. And after intelligence, um, we had is, which is number seven, of course. So we have seven underscore is. And um, just do not mind the arrows, there's no space here. And after is, we have about, because we say the intelligence is about design systems. So everything is being discussed about designing. So after after intelligence is about, so this the about which should come about. And after about, we would probably have the systems. So this is the tenors for systems. So these were the different syntax we have to follow with the that intelligence is about system. Now it's, it's important to frame a relationship among the head and the root or the head and the next head, which is a company. So after that, um, there's obviously a mark here. So I would say that the role here is marked. And for designing and intelligence is it's probably subject because it's it's been discussing about a subject which is we are designing an intelligence. We so there's something description of intelligence being given. So we can probably give this as subject. Probably it would make more sense if we give it as n subject because that's what the common notation is about. And after n subject. Uh, we have designing is so that falls under the part of CO, which is another reference which we made. Um, just in case to be clear, I'm just putting out an arrow. And then we have designing and about, which is again a mark, 
because we're discussing that um, this uh, there's a description about what is being designed or about what is being designed. So we can probably say mark. And then between the system and designing, there's an object reference being made because they're asking what is being designed or who is uh, or who is it being designed on. So it is the system which is being designed on. So probably this can fit in as the D object. This is again a reference, as I would say. So once we have these ready, um, we are done with most of the sentences now. Now, since we have intelligence here, as you see, now this intelligence must be related with this artificial because that is the only sentence that we're missing here. So this is something that we missed upon. Um, so probably something like this. So, you know, we have covered one view is that intelligence is about design system, but the artificial was missing. So this intelligence will cover up for that. Um, probably five underscore artificial should make it. So you can try to get five underscore artificial. Now, again, we need to define the relation between the word artificial and intelligence. And A mod fits the category because we are describing the intelligence. What sort of intelligence would that be? The thing is, when you're defining your questions or when you're defining the different parameters that might be involved, you need to ask the questions to yourself and to the system as to what might be the system, what, what might be the root, what might be the relationship, how might that relationship affect the next sentences? Because you see, there's a tree hierarchy. There was another tree which was followed before this. So um, it's, it's important to form the relationships. So once we have intelligence is artificial, you can probably mention that it's a an A more category because we are describing what sort of intelligence that would be. So once we have our five as well ready, we are left with these aspects that are as intelligent as humans. Now, you see we have the systems. So all of the description here that are as intelligent as humans is being made with reference to the systems. So um, we are discussing about systems right now and our system will be the head right now. So. I can say that after the systems, we are discussing that it is intelligent. So our uh, intelligent will be the next root word after the systems. So um, we can probably say that after systems, you have the word intelligent forming. Um, I cannot see the screen, so I'll have to write it in half. So there's 14 underscore intelligent. Now, what this signifies is that we are discussing about the characteristics of the system. We are saying that we have to design a system which has to be varying with the value or with equality, I would say. So this system and this intelligence, so it will fit in the category of a relationship, which is uh, RELCL, which is usually defined in this notion. So you can probably write it as, um, you know, according, um, according to the reference of a relationship, um, that's how the system and intelligence works out. Now, once we have the intelligence, we have that are as as and humans. So we have about five sentences, five words in meaning. So after intelligence, um, we should have a that. We should also be having an R. We must, there are that R, and then there's S, and then there's humans. Now, do not get confused. We're discussing about this as over here and this, not this one, because the humans is another root over here, and this AS will be covered under that human. Um, let me make sense of it. So, once we have the intelligence, we have to fit it as 11 underscore that. Um, probably after that, we have R, so it will be 12 underscore R. And we have, um, of course, AS. So AS will fit in. And at the last, we have humans, which is the last word. So we can probably fit in humans at 16. Now, we're only left with one word, which is AS. But before that, we'll have to define the relations for this. So um, there'll be different relations. Now, intelligent and that are defined with the subject. So you can write this in subject and intelligent and R are again specified with COP, which is another reference being made here. And intelligent and as we have the advanced or the adverb mode, 
because we are discussing that you know um, it is being discussed that the it is as intelligence as something. So there's the ADV model which is being made. And for the humans, again, there will be an N mod. Um, you can probably write it as N mod. Should make sense. Now we're only left with this uh, AS. Now, well, that's because you know um, this AS is considering the humans along with the intelligence here. So a system might get confused with the two AS. So in order to probably not make it too much confused, we we'll be considering the fact that we have another AS over here. And we can probably display write it as AS over here. Um, something as 15 underscore AS. And again, the difference here is it is a case. Now you see that the um, it is different from this case over here, which is number 30, because that was an ADV more, and this is just a case because we're discussing that the humans might or the system should be as something as something. So this is um, a case, I would say. So <clears throat> This was um, one example of discussing how exactly a sentence um, might be parsed in different language, I mean, um, different phrases. So this is all about it. We have one view is that artificial intelligence is about design systems that are as intelligent as humans. So um, let me recall, we first define the root. After the root, we have to define its next root. And do care that the root is usually followed by a subject or a CPOP. And we had the view and the design here. Um, probably something as this. Um, we had the view and the design. Now, it's important to understand the different aspects this might offer. So you might want to read more about it. Um, so this view and this design and this, there was one behind it. So you need to define the relationship about each of them. This mark, this end subject, this mark, this the object. There, there, there are a lot of relationships where it's important to mention what sort of relationship you're looking for, especially in these cases. So that is one aspect of it. Um, we'll revert back to the PPT now. Um, I hope the PPT is visible. <clears throat> um, is the PPT visible right now? Okay, so um, we will be probably going ahead with the software layouts. So, you know, um, this the, these are the features of Anusarka. So our Anusarka software is basically based on, more, more or less on um, whatever we discussed right now. So um, there are various layers. There's for um, this sort of layering, for this, uh, the, um, you know, the processes which are done, we have to layer out what sort of relationship has to be put about. So that's one layer. And in the next layer, it might have to do a transliteration where it might have to check if a similar word would have appeared. So there's another layer. And then it might have to check for morphism. It might have to check if there were any other sort of relationships might, that might have come out. Um, like in our previous example, we had two AS coming up. So we have to be especially careful because, you know, this can usually confuse the system a lot. So there were two A's and we had to um, maintain less ambiguity and discuss about how these two A's might not disturb the system, might not confuse the system in more simpler terms. So once that happens, um, the software in archive obviously ensures that the user should be able to understand the concepts of is not care about how efficient the model is. We, we do care about how, how much sentence the sentence make. So that being said, um, that does not mean that, you know, just like on machine learning models or in the neural networking models, we usually care about the efficiency of more than 50% or central person. But this might not be the case here because the sense of a sentence should be more than the accuracy. Because if I say that, um, you know, tomorrow is Sunday, and if I convert it to Japanese or if I convert it to Hindi or if I convert it to Chinese, um, it should make more sense if I discuss about the um, sense of it and not about the accuracy. It does not matter if it says 
um, you know, tomorrow as uh, something different. But then if it says tomorrow is Monday or Friday, and although Monday, tomorrow is Sunday, so that is something worrying. So we do not care about the accuracy, we care more about making sense of it. Um, that being said, there are, you know, some exciting um, NLP challenges which you can work upon. So <clears throat> one famous challenge is the human language like understanding where you usually focus on making chatbots or making different applications which might um, help the end user um, in making good thoughts processes or making a good prediction system. So this human language understanding there, where you have to understand how exactly does the human language, um, you know, it might interfere with the understanding of it. And then there's the document segmentation part where you read in a document where you understand if a particular document has to be um, translated in a particular language. And in case it is, what sort of coding do we have to do? What sort of translation systems do we need to put in? And then there's grounded work with vision and speech because more of what I covered was text-based NLP. But then of course there's vision-based NLP, there's speech-based NLP. So we can probably have a look at that as well. So. Um, Speed-based NLP is something um, you can coordinate to the filters in Instagram or Facebook that you might have. Now, usually um, when you post a photo on Instagram, you might put out a filter. But what I'm in speech is, uh, suppose I'm speaking right now, this background noise. So your system or the, the system that you build, that should be too intelligent to, to reduce the background noise that might be coming in. So. It's more like typing in that there has to be a filter which has to reduce the background noise. So that's how your speech comes in. And vision comes the same way. I mean, you train your model in such a way in case it's if it's in this FM, if it's not safe for minors, or in case you want to be a particular audience to see it, it has to be grounded language barrier um, along with the different encoding style that might come in. And of course, you can use it for skill learning, you can use it for navigation because there are endless possibilities in this world. And of course, there are there are machine learning models which are really important, this reinforcement learning that you do um, either the bias learning or you look at whether this sentence makes more sense than the previous sentence. And you will pos you possibly make sense of different words, I would say. And these are some exciting NLP channels which you can work upon. There are a lot of information on the internet. You can participate in the Kaggle competitions, um, which are usually held once a week or twice a week. And those have really good data set to work upon. And <clears throat> once that happens, um, you can probably look at the notes. Um, Anusarka is, is um, obviously um, it's a software which is based on rules. We do not care about making it more efficient. We write a rule, um, let's assume we write a rule that, you know, um, um, if a noun is followed by a pronoun, there's a different set of rules that have to be come in. And if a verb is followed by an adjective, there's a different rule. So you see, it's, it's more like a rule-based language and it's it's based on um, different encoding styles, I would say, it depends on who is coding, of course. And of course, um, there's a language called CLIPS, C-L-I-P-S, it's C language interpreter language. So that language usually works well for the rule-based language. You can also use it for the functional-based language, um, like with Python or Java. But then usually the rule-based languages, especially in Anusarika, works really cool. And uh, that should make sense of it. And of course, um, most of uh, all of the program and language data is free and it is open source. If you do not participate in GSA, that's a different thing. Um, you can probably have a look at the website page at IIIT.ac.in. Um, and there's a there's a web page available for Anusarka. There are a total of four maps with LTRC, um, which work in accordance with each other. And this is one of the largest lab in South India as far as the speech and language recognition is concerned. So um, most of the work is open free, open source and free. And another note is that you know um, this software is. On base, it, it, it's on comparison with Google Translator, Bing Translator, because it's been worked upon since many years. And you know what happens usually is that, um, that there's not much um, care given to a language, um, especially the dialect just spoken in a particular language in, in a particular region. 
and that is what the Lusaka's main aim is, so that we can you know probably have more focus on the dialect and the cultural heritage of a language rather than just translating a random sentence which is being put in. So our focus has always been to preserve the heritage, to work on the dialect aspect of the language, and also look at the different aspects of programming because it's not always Python. We work with clips, we work with Python, we work so work with C++ at times because there are different languages, there are different tool-based languages, of course. So that's one aspect of it. But overall, if you wish to contribute to Rosata, then yes, you're welcome. Um, you're always welcome. Um, we have different open source gateways are available online. You can contribute to the code. Uh, yes, you can download the software for yourself and have a look at it. And I think that was the end of it. Uh, this is my user email ID um, in case any one of you wants to connect with me. Um, if you want the data set or if you want to have a chat with me on NLP, I'm welcome to it. And I think, yeah, I'm open for doubts now in case anybody is having any doubts. Thank you very much, Jasmine. So I heard people uh, are looking for a company to work as intern in Japan. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. right. えっと、ジャスビンさんはえ、インドの方なんですが、日本でインターンできる会社を探しているそうです。そうですかですね。そうなので、あのここに連絡してあげてください。Okay, thank you. Right, thank you. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Right.